Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And we welcome you to this very special meeting of the Riverview Baptist Church. And we know this is unique because of the snowstorms that are out there, that many of you are not able to gather and assemble together with us, but you're able to listen to it wherever you're at, hopefully getting warm. And because this is a very special meeting, I have a great desire to be an encouragement to you. And so today we're going to deliver to you a very special message to everyone that is listening for the purpose of encouraging you and reminding you of what a great God we have. If you don't mind, let's take some time to open up the Word of God. If you don't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Old Testament passage of Habakkuk. The Old Testament passage of Habakkuk that is found in the Minor Prophets section. If you find the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and turn the other direction, you run into Malachi, then you come to Zechariah, then you will come to, <coughs> excuse me, Haggai, Zephaniah, and then the book of Habakkuk. The book of Habakkuk, and maybe if you need the help, it's right by Nahum. Maybe if that helps you find it a little bit quicker. But look with me, if you don't mind, in the book of Habakkuk, the book of Habakkuk and chapter number one, the book of Habakkuk chapter one. And if you don't mind, notice with me, starting at verse number one, Habakkuk chapter one and verse one. The word of God says this, the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou will not hear, even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou will not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there <coughs> are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slack, and judgment doth never go forth, for the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Behold, ye among the heathen, and regard, and I will work marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that we find in the book of Habakkuk chapter number one? The book of Habakkuk chapter number one, and notice with me in verse number five. In verse number five, notice the phrase, for I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe. For I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe. And because this is a special message, I want to highlight something a little bit different here. And I want to describe to you the God of history. The God of history. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God. Thank you for the great privilege and the, the blessings that we have of technology, that there are many people who are listening right now who are able to get a blessing and encouragement from the Word. Maybe there's someone out there who's caught in the snow. Maybe someone has health issues and it's made them where they're unable to come. Maybe just someone needs encouragement now and you've arranged a situation. You've arranged them to be in a time and a place such as this where they could hear about you. And we thank you for being a great God. There are many people who need this encouragement, many people who need this reminder of who you are. And again, because that's our main purpose is we want to show you high, holy, and lifted up. We're asking that you would do that today with your precious spirit, that you would open up your scriptures, that you would give us an understanding of history, and that we could see you moving and working and directing and controlling all of history for the purpose that we could trust you with our future. 
Thank you again, God, for being a wonderful God. Fill me with your precious spirit and be an encouragement to all those within the sound of my voice. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The setting of this book is about 600 B.C. The destruction of Jerusalem is just around the corner. However, Habakkuk the prophet doesn't quite uh, know that that's around the corner. There's been some warnings. Jeremiah has been preaching for about 30 something years about this time. And he's been trying to warn people to get right with God. But Habakkuk the prophet has his own walk with God. And he has something unique within the book of Habakkuk. Most of the minor prophets are a preacher who is addressing a certain group of people. For example, Nahum is addressing the city of Nineveh. Jonah is addressing the city of Nineveh. There are Amos, who is a southern preacher, who goes up and preaches to the northern kingdom, so that way they would get right. And many of the minor prophets are addressing a specific people or a specific nation. However, the book of Habakkuk is a little bit different in that here the prophet is in a conversation with God himself. That throughout this book, Habakkuk talks, and then God talks. And Habakkuk talks, and God answers. And Habakkuk talks, and God replies. And so what we have here is a conversation that is recorded between a preacher and his God. If you don't mind, notice the condition of the world that Habakkuk lived in. As a preacher, as he's looking at the world, he's seeing how awful it is, and he does the natural thing. He goes to the Lord in prayer. Notice with me in the book of Habakkuk in chapter number one. The book of Habakkuk chapter one, and notice it starts off in verse one. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. O Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou will not hear, even unto thee... <laughs> Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou will not save. He starts off this prayer and saying, God, we've been praying, we've been praying, we've been praying, and our nation hasn't changed. We've been pointing out the violence. We've been pointing out how things have been falling apart, and nothing has been delivered. Nothing has changed. Verse number three, why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me. And there are those that raise up strife and contention. The prophet as he's talking to God is saying, God, look at the violence. You show me that this is sin. You tell me in the Bible that is sin. And I point it out and nothing changes. I'm exposed all the time and my heart is broken looking at this sin and this sin, and this abomination, and this thing. And I'm looking at my nation, and I'm going to you, God, and saying, God, my nation's falling apart. Will you please do something about it? Verse number four. Therefore, the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. Habakkuk is going to God and said, our nation is so much in trouble. That even the laws aren't standing. The laws are being slacked. The laws are being changed. Because there's more people who are wrong. More people who are wicked than that are righteous. And so what happened? The laws are reflecting the morals of the society. That things are falling apart. Things that are clearly not right are now legal. Things that are clearly wrong and immoral are now legal and nothing has been done about it and people seem to be fine about this and what we have here is a preacher who's going up to his God as he should and he's praying for his nation for his nation to be spared for God to do something with his nation but a surprising thing happens in verse number five and verses one through four we could see the prophet Habakkuk talking to God and as he's talking to God, something unusual happened, something probably he wasn't expecting. God answered back. So he'd been asking, God, what are you going to do about our nation? God, how are you going to spare our nation? God, what are you going to do about all the violence and the abomination? Lord, heal our land. Do something with this. How are you going to fix this? And God said, let me tell you how I'm going to fix this. Notice with me in verse 5. Behold, ye among heathen. All right, Habakkuk, you came to pray, and you want to know what I'm going to do about this? Ye among the heathen. What? Yep, I'm going to send you 
into captivity. I'm going to take a wicked nation. I'm going to bring them. They're going to destroy your country. They're going to transport you and your people all across the Babylonian Empire. And we're going to destroy this nation. The temple is going to be destroyed. Religion is going to be destroyed. Everything's gone. That's how I'm going to solve it. Well, that wasn't the answer he was looking for. Would that be the answer you'd be looking for? Well, I, God, can't you just wave your magic wand and make everyone right? God, can't you just, just touch people and all of a sudden they wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to serve Jesus? I, I, can't you just make things easy? Can't you just with one word snap your fingers and kill everyone that's opposed to you? God says, nope. Ye among the heathen. That's the answer. Now notice as God follows up this answer. Behold ye among the heathen in regard and wonder marvelously. God says, all right, I want you to sit down. I want you to grab a hold of something. Uh, ye among the heathen, but grab a hold of something. You need to understand this principle. He says, for I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it be told to you. He says, Habakkuk, I got a plan. And if I told you beforehand what my plan was, you would say, no, -uh, there's no way that's going to work. There's no way that could ever come to pass. There's no way it could be fixed in that manner. And God says, no, you may not believe it's going to work, but I know what's best. I know exactly how to fix things. Now, if you don't mind, we have to understand what truly needs to be fixed. We know that the nation of Israel began, the Hebrew people began with Abraham, who God called him out of the Ur of Chaldees. And we know that Abraham's father, whose name was Terah, had worshipped other gods. He worshipped the moon god, Sin, who was the local god of that area of Ur of Chaldees. So Abraham had grown up in a society that worshipped other gods. <coughs> we know that as Things went on as time went on that Abraham had a son by the name of Isaac. Isaac had a son by the name of Jacob. Jacob ended up having 12 sons that became the 12 tribes of Israel. And we could watch over and over throughout history the same thing happen. That people got satisfied with where they were at. And they began to serve other gods rather than the God of the Bible. Over and over people would get comfortable they would stop thinking about God. They would stop serving God. And then they started serving other gods. Or maybe perhaps there became more trouble. And so they began to pray to other gods. You know, the whole idea of polytheism, which is the idea of the worship of many gods, comes about because the people have an idea that one God is not able to handle everything. So they break down these little G gods into little areas that they could handle. For example, one of the gods that they worshipped back in those days that the Israelites kept going back and worshipped was Baal. He was the thunder god. He was the god who brought rain. So you would have a farmer who would say, I need my crops. And I know God, Jehovah God, he's probably too busy. So I'm going to pray to this other God whose only job is to bring rain. And maybe he could do that one thing. He's only got one thing to do. Bring rain. All right, bring rain. And then they would go to other gods of Ashtaroth or Ishtar. And that would be the fertility goddess. And they would say, oh, I need a baby. And I don't want to pray to big G God because maybe he's too busy. I'm going to pray to the one God who's in charge of giving babies. And that's Ishtar. I'll, I'll pray to her. And so on and on they would go praying to these little G gods. Instead of praying to the God of the universe, the God who can do everything. Because they stopped trusting in that big G God. As you go through the book of Judges, what happens over and over? The people rested, and as they rested, they wandered away from God and started serving other gods. So they put God put them under oppression. As they were under oppression, they finally had enough, and they cried out to God, God, please, we'll serve you. And God sent a deliverer. And as they were delivered, they rested, and then they got used to not serving God. And so they served other little G-gods and the cycle went on over and over again. As we now come up to Habakkuk's day, as we come up to Jeremiah's day, we have a nation that is trusting in other things other than the God of the Bible. 
They're trusting in other things. So when God is listening to Habakkuk's prayer, we know the Habakkuk saying, look at our nation. Look at the wickedness. Look at the violence. Look at the, the law. It's not being obeyed. The laws are changing. We know those are symptoms of the problem. What is the problem? The problem is that the people were not serving the God of the Bible. And because they weren't serving God of the Bible, that all of these other things came to so how is God going to fix this? Well, he said, I'm going to do something that if I told you what I was doing in advance, you would say, nah, -uh, there's no way it's going to work. What is God going to do? He's going to allow the Babylonian nation to come and destroy their temple, stop their religion, kidnap them and transport them thousands of miles away to a land that has even more gods than they do. That doesn't sound like it's going to work, does it? It doesn't sound like those people are going to serve God after being transported to this place where they serve more than one God. How is this going to work? Well, with this back setting, I'd like to describe to you from the Bible about this God of history, the God who knows what he's doing. The very first thing I'd like to show you from the scriptures is that God sees all history, that God sees all history history. We'll be coming back to the book of Habakkuk eventually, but for now, turn with me to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, chapter number 41. The book of Isaiah and chapter number 41. The book of Isaiah, chapter 41, is a passage that shows that God has a sense of humor. A place where God is laughing at these other people who are serving other gods. <coughs> And so what we see in Isaiah chapter 41, notice if you don't mind in verse number 21. Isaiah 41 and in verse number 21. Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. Let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things, what they may be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare us things to come. Show us the things that are hereafter, that we may know that ye are gods. Yea, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and behold it all together. In this passage here, God is having a God off. And he said, all right, fine. You think these gods are real? How about this? Tell me something that they've ever predicted that came to pass. Tell me something now predict something so that we may behold in the future that they predicted something. He says, I dare them. And the reason why God can say this is because only God knows all of time. One of the attributes of God is that God is omnipresent. Omnipresent. The word omni means all. Present means, of course, present. And so we would say that God is ever present. He is all present. And many people stop the definition with the idea that God is everywhere at once. And we understand that does carry the idea of being present. But it goes beyond that, that God is not just omnipresent in the sense that he is everywhere at once, but he is every time at once. God is always in the present tense. Because God is the one who created time, he is outside of time. God has no beginning and he has no end. And he is seeing all of history unfold at the same time. That means the same time as he's watching this service go on right now, he is watching the children of Israel cross the Red Sea. The same time as he's watching this service, he's watching the millennial kingdom unfold. That is all present tense to God. God has no past and he has no future. It is all present tense. He sees it all unfolding at once. So therefore he could easily go to us who is stuck in time and say, hey, let me tell you what I'm seeing right now. And so a prophet can predict it, uh, write it down and see what God sees. And then when we catch up to that point in time, we say, look, God was right. That's one of the amazing things about God is that God sees all of history. He's watching it all unfold. He is a God who's omnipresent. He is every time at once. 
Now this helps us out because God sees what you're going to face. He sees where you're going. He can see where you're supposed to end up. He can help direct your path because he sees all of history. He knows what is required to get you from one place to another. He's a God who sees all of history. But not only does God see all of history, meaning and just in a passive view, God, the second thing, God controls all of history. God controls all of history. While you're in the book of Isaiah, look with me a couple chapters over, Isaiah 44. And let me show you one of my favorite prophecies in the Bible. Now, as you're turning there, may I teach you something about prophecy? That the Bible is about one third prophecy and most of it is fulfilled prophecy. There's only a small portion of the word of God that is still waiting to be fulfilled. Most of it is already fulfilled and we have the hindsight of history that we can go back and look at the prophecy and see how it was fulfilled and see the details. Also, I want to remind you that prophecy is that God does not give general vague prophecies, things that will be, uh, can be fulfilled so many different ways. For example, it's not the idea, oh, someone in the future is going to have a headache and I'm going to heal it. Well, that's general. That's vague. The prophecies that God gives is very, very specific and can only be fulfilled in a certain way. An example of this that is something that I love to show people when they want to know, is the Bible true? Can we trust the Word of God? And yes, we could trust the Bible is the Word of God because of fulfilled history. And so what we could see is that God controls all of history. Notice with me in Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah and chapter 44. Notice with me starting at verse 26. Isaiah 44 and verse 26 that confirmeth the word of his servant and performeth the counsel of his messengers that saith to Jerusalem, thou shalt be inhabited and to the cities of Jerusalem ye shall be built and I will raise up the decayed places thereof that saith to the deep, be dry and I will dry up the rivers that saith to Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even to the saying of Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have beholden, to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates that shall not be shut. And I will go before thee, and make the crooked places straight. And I will break in pieces the gates of brass, and cut asunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness." and hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. Now this is a powerful passage, especially when you put it in the light of history. The book of Isaiah is a written approximately 700 B.C. All right, so 700 B.C. At this time, at 700 B.C., the Assyrians are the world empire. They're the leaders of the world empire. But what is going to happen is that the Babylonians are going to take over and they are going to destroy the Assyrians. Then the Babylonians are going to destroy Jerusalem in 586 BC. So we could already see Isaiah is written in 700 and it's referring to events that occur later on. Here it talks about the cities that Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt. Well in Isaiah's time Jerusalem still exists. It hasn't been destroyed yet. And yet here's a prophecy saying it's going to be rebuilt. The other cities of Judah are going to be raised back up. That's going to occur later. Then it refers to a man by the name of Cyrus. This is one out of only four people who were named by name before they were ever conceived. God knew his name and knew what he was going to do. Could you imagine that? 150 years plus before he was ever born, God had already talked about him 
and what he was going to do. Cyrus the Great is going to become the very first emperor of the Persian Empire. And the Persian Empire in 536 BC is going to destroy Jerusalem or destroy Babylon and they're going to allow the people to come back into Jerusalem to rebuild the gates. But how it's done is even more fantastic. Notice if you don't mind in uh, chapter 44 and verse number 27. That saith to the deep, be dry and I will dry up the rivers. Notice with me if you don't mind as we go on in verse number, or chapter 45 verse 1. That saith to the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have beholden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Here it's referring to the city of Babylon. Now the city of Babylon in the ancient world was considered one of the wonders. That its gates were 40 feet high and so wide, as I've been told, that four, four horse-drawn chariots, so four chariots that each of them had four horses, could ride side by side through the width of the top of the, the this gate, this um this wall. And the Babylonians were prideful of their wall. No one could defeat us. No one could destroy us because they can't get through our walls. Well, Cyrus the Great understood this. How am I going to destroy Babylon? How am I going to destroy the city and I can't get through their walls? So what he did is he went upstream of the Tigris River and he dammed it up. And he made it so the Tigris River ran dry, just like the Bible said, a hundred and some years before it occurred. And then what happened? As Cyrus and his troops began to go to the dried up riverbed, there was a two-leaved gate that had allowed the water to go through, but wouldn't allow someone else to go through. Well, the guards of those two-leaved gates were guarding that place. They saw the river dried up and they said, ah, forget this. They opened up those two leave gates and Cyrus and his army were able to walk into the walls of Babylon through that river and take Babylon overnight without firing a shot. They didn't have to destroy the walls. They were able to conquer it within. And God predicted how it was going to happen with the dried up river, the two river gates, that it was Cyrus the Great who was going to do this, that they were the ones who were going to do this. And then Cyrus the Great, when he destroyed Babylon, he conquered the Babylonian Empire. He allowed the Hebrew people to go back home to rebuild their temple, to rebuild their place. And God said it was going to happen. He said, it's my servant, my anointed, my shepherd. I'm the one who's putting him there. I've arranged all of this to happen. And he talked about it hundreds of years before it occurred. We see that there's a God who controls history. So as we're speaking about the God of history, we explain that God sees all of history, that he is omnipresent, that he created time, he's outside of time. He could see all of time at once in the present tense. He has no past and he has no future. He is always present tense. But God isn't just a passive observer of time. He also controls history and he's able to put people in the right spot and he knows what's going to happen and he could direct their paths and he knows how to get them and work with them and the Bible explains that, that God controls all of history. Which goes back to us, that we know that we're not omniscient, meaning you can't see everything at once. You don't know everything. We are very limited. But can You trust God. Remember what Habakkuk was told. I'm going to work a work in your days that if I told you, you wouldn't believe. You want to know what amazing thing happened? That the Hebrew people, after they got back, spending 70 years in captivity, came back and became the most monotheistic people that ever existed. Even today, an Orthodox Jew said, there's only one God. Only one. God broke them of serving all these other gods. See how God did that? (coughs) It doesn't make sense to us how that worked out, but God knew exactly what was necessary. 
So how do we respond? Well, if you don't mind, turn back with me to the book of Habakkuk. And let's see how the prophet responds to the God of history. So knowing that there's a God who sees all of history, and knowing that there's a God who controls history, what should my response be? What is my reaction to the God who sees all of history? How is my response to the God of history? Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to show you some things that the prophet Habakkuk did because of knowing who God was. His first response, his first reaction was obedience. It was obedience. Notice with me Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 1. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and, I, and set me upon the tower and watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Here it says that Habakkuk is standing on his watch. He's standing on a tower. And basically he's getting alone with God and he's preparing himself. God, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do it. I'm ready. You could rebuke me. You could tell me I need to change. You could point out what I need to do. But whatever needs to happen, I'm ready to obey. Because I know that you know what's best. I know that you know how to guide me. I know that you know how to get me from here to here. I'm willing to be obedient because I know what you know. You know what you're doing. Isn't that a great trust to have in God? That you trust him so much that whatever he tells you to do, you're willing to do it because as for God, his way is perfect. Do you believe that God knows what he's doing? Do you believe that God knows what's best for you? Well, if you believe that, then you'd be ready to obey him because he knows what is best. There may be some things that God wants you to do that you don't want to do, but he knows what's best for you. You do this and you're going to be better off. Can you trust that God knows what he's doing? There's a second response that we see here in chapter 2 in verse number 4. In chapter 2 in verse number 4, it says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up, is not upright in him. But the just shall live by his faith. Here we could see this powerful statement. So much of the Apostle Paul uses it three times within the New Testament. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Remember, faith is trusting in Jesus. It's looking unto God, trusting in Him. The just shall live by faith. Meaning that I don't see how it's going to work out, but I trust God. Whatever He tells me to do, I'm going to do that. I'm going to trust in Him. God knows what He's doing. Now notice this. Oftentimes people will think that the opposite of faith is unbelief. But you know that the Bible gives a different opposite for this? Notice in verse number four again, it says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up. You could put in your margin there, that's pride. You want to know what the opposite of faith is? It's pride. Because you are either trusting in God, which is faith, or you're trusting in your own answers, which is pride. Which one do you trust? So when you come to a decision and God says, this is what you need to do, you're either going to go by faith and say, yes, sir, or you're going to go by pride and say, you know what? I think there's a better way. The just shall live by faith. And if you're not living by faith, it is because of pride. So as we continue with this response, how do we respond to the God who knows all of history? How do we respond to the God who sees everything? Well, first of all, by obedience. I've determined I'm going to be obedient. I prepared whatever God tells me to do, I'm going to do it. The second thing, the just shall live by faith. I'm either going to trust in God or I'm going to determine what's right. If I determine what's right, it's pride and I'm going to mess things up. I can trust God. There's this third thing that we see here. Notice with me in Habakkuk chapter number three. Habakkuk chapter 3. What is man's reaction to the God of history? Well, he prepared himself to obey. He understood that the just shall live by faith. I can trust God. Then we come to the idea of chapter 3. And notice with me in verse number 2. 
Chapter 3 in verse number 2. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of years. In the midst of years, make known, notice this last phrase, in wrath, remember mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. Something else we need to realize is that God is always working. God is always working. That last phrase there, he says, <coughs> in wrath, remember mercy. And in the wrath of remember mercy, we could see that it's going to revive thy work, God's work in the midst of the years. That we understand that God has got a plan. In order to bring revival, in order to bring new life to his people, there are some times that God's people have to go through bad things. Did you know that the New Testament says that same thing? Probably the second most famous Bible verse in all the world would be Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, which says, For all things work together for good to them that love God. <clears throat> to them that are the called according to his purpose. It says all things work together for good. It doesn't say that all things are good, but all things work together for good. So if someone has an illness, cancer, sickness, can God use that sickness for good? Absolutely. What happens if somebody has a uh, car accident? Can God use that car accident for good? Yes. What if you have a flat tire and you're running late? Do you have to yell at the car and kick the tire a couple times? Or can you trust that God knows what he's doing? God knows what he's doing. Maybe perhaps there's someone who's having a pity party. And I wanted to go to church, but the storm didn't come. Why would God do such a thing? Well, maybe God just wanted to put you in a place where you could listen to a message like this. And remember that there's a God who knows what he's doing. And that he can allow some bad things to happen in order to get the best things from you. Romans 8.28 is followed by Romans 8.29. Romans 8.28, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are thee called to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. You know why all things work together for good? To make us more like Jesus. Verse number 29 adds that to it. To make us more like Jesus. You know why some things happen in your life that you would have never chosen for yourself? Because God wants to make you more like Jesus. You know, when you stub your toe and you're getting all mad, well, can you trust that God knows what he's doing? He's trying to help you become more like Jesus. What happens when something happens at work or school that you didn't plan for? God knows what he's doing. He's trying to use that thing to work together for good to make you more like Jesus. In wrath, remember mercy. Revive thy work in the midst of the years. You see, if you understood that there's a God who controls all of history, who knows all of history, who knows what's best for you, you can allow even the bad things to happen in your life because you know you can trust this God. Can you trust him? In wrath, remember mercy. Revive thy work in the midst of the years. Realize that God is always working. And his working is for our best. Because the best thing is to be more like Jesus. You know, there are times in order to make us more like Jesus, God has to put us in a trial. Think about this. Some of you uh, are strong. Did you get strong just overnight? What if you were to lift some weights? Do you go ahead and pack up all the weights on the bar at once? No, you have to just put enough to push yourself, right? And then what happens when that becomes easier? Do you just keep going with it easy? No, you have to put more weight on there. And then you have to lift that until it becomes easy. And then you more add more weight. You know what God has to do in order to make us spiritually strong? He has to add more weight to us. And more weight. Otherwise we'd be weak. Flabby pathetic anemic Christians. God knows that we need. This hard times. In order to become spiritually strong. In order to be more like Jesus. And wrath remember mercy. Revive us. 
in the midst of the year. Revive thy work in the midst of the years. God is always working. But there's one last principle. You see, we're talking about what is our reaction if we see that God controls all of history. He knows all of history. He knows all of time. What is our response? Our first response is that we should be obedient. God, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do it. We understand, second of all, the just shall live by faith. Then I'm going to determine that God is right, not me. A third thing is that we understand that all things work together for good. That God is always working. And he allows some bad things in our life to happen. But there's a one more response that shows, are we truly trusting in the God who knows all of history? You want to know how you can know if you're trusting? I mean... Some things you don't have any choice over. Well, I'm going to go through this sickness, whether I like it or not, I'm going to have to suffer through it. And so you could begrudgingly go through those trials. Have you ever begrudgingly went through something? What is a response to show, are you truly trusting that God knows what he's doing when bad things happen, when hard times come? Well, notice with me in the book of Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk chapter 3, and notice with me in verse 17. Habakkuk chapter, 17, uh, chapter 3, starting at verse 17, notice this. Although the fig shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vines. The labor of olives shall fail, and the fields shall yield no meat, and the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be, shall be no herd in the stalls. Verse 17 is just a list of bad things, right? None of these are things that you want to volunteer for. It's saying all of your crops dry up. The f trees are no longer blossoming. You're no longer getting fruit from the vine. The uh, fields shall yield no meat. The flocks are dying. They're not multiplying. They're being cut off in the fold. They're being stolen. Everything's falling apart. Everything's going. Notice this, verse number 18. Yet, that's an important word there. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like hind's feet. And he will make me to walk upon mine hind places to the singer of, upon my string instruments. We have this principle that some people call living in the yet. Verse 17 is a list of all these bad things. All these bad things are happening. Yet... I will rejoice in the Lord. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. You want to know if you're truly trusting in God? If you're truly trusting in the God of history, then are you living in the yet? Are you able to sing and rejoice and praise God when bad things are going on? When you're sitting at home and sick and not feeling well, can you still say God is good and God is right? When your tire is flat and it's snowing outside, can you still say God is good? And God is right. When you got to go shovel eight inches of snow later on, can you still say God is good and God is right? When you got to go in for your cancer treatment, can you still say God is good and God is right? When your heater goes out in your house, can you still say God is good and God is still right? When your kids are sick and you don't know what to do, can you still say God is good and God is right? When your paychecks don't seem to stretch out the way that you want them to go, can you still say God is good and God is right? This is the idea of living in the yet. Can I trust that there's a God who loves me, a God who knows my future, a God who knows what needs to be placed in my path to make me more like him? If I truly trust him, then I will yet I will rejoice. I will still sing his praises. I will still say he's good even when things around me don't seem to be good. Living in the yet. You see, we have a God who knows what he's doing. A God who knows all of history. A God who sees all of history. A God who knows what's best for us. Can you trust him? Maybe there's someone in the sound of my voice that has been having a hard time trusting. You've been looking at the circumstances and find yourself increasingly frustrated, maybe even bitter towards the things that are occurring. It seems like the harder that you work, the more things fall apart. Can you trust that there's a God who loves you and knows what he's doing? 
Can you sing? Can you rejoice? Maybe you just need to go up to this God who loves to hear from you and tell him, Lord, I'm having a hard time right now. I'm having a hard time seeing what you're doing. Can you give me some help? Can you give me some grace? Maybe there's someone in here that has a temper problem. As soon as something doesn't happen the way that you want it to happen, you instantly fly off the handle. You instantly want to try to beat someone up or kick the walls, kick the cat, throw something. Can you trust that there's a God who knows what he's doing and can you look at him? Can you depend upon him during those times? Can you rejoice in him? Maybe you're not going through a trial right now, but let me tell you, there's a storm coming. You're either coming out of a storm, in the middle of a storm, or going into a storm. You're going to need this message sooner or later because you're going to be tried. Can you trust God? And the best way that you're going to see, am I trusting God, is not only are you obedient, not only if you're trusting in Him, not only do you recognize that God is working, but can you rejoice when those hard times come? Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 920- Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.